Hi, Michael. Hello. Okay, so we, we ended yesterday on this inferior dislocation with a very superior hill sacs and then a uh, Hegel lesion with a humeral avulsion of the inferior glenohumeral humeral ligament in that case. Uh, so, uh, well, Michael, why don't you take this subtle case? Michael? Sorry, I had it muted. So first thing I noticed is the humerus is not in the right location. It is um, yeah, inferiorly displaced and it's impacted and kind of locked in with the inferior aspect of the glenoid. Yeah, the patient didn't think it was humerus at all. Uh, that's, that's not that funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so here we can see the biceps tendon, we can see the supraspinatus coming around. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, so that's an inferior dislocation and the empty. Well, one way to describe it is it's a mess. Yeah, really. So that's a... And, and it's chronic, I think, isn't it, John? Uh, well, there's probably some acute edema here. I. Uh, yeah. Uh, that, that, that can occur just from movement, though, can it? May well not have been the first time, but I, I, I yeah, don't yeah. know how acute this was or chronic. A atrophy, et cetera. Yeah, there was a lot of injury there. Yeah, and they, they can pull their, uh, I mean, brachial plexus uh, injuries yeah. uh, with that, I think. Absolutely. And um, that's one of the problems. Yeah. Ask you, what do you think of this case? Same as the other one, except not as pretty. Yeah. We see the anterior inferior dislocation of the humeral head here. And if it's the same patient, it looks like it's been put back, relocated. And there seems to be some low density substance in the inferior capsule right there. Yeah. Uh, uh, that looks like a middle glenohumeral ligament. Uh, it's probably it a, looks like some injury. Either an anterior band, but it's probably a middle a torn middle glenohumeral ligament due to the uh, to the displacement, right? Okay. All right. So this is a 19 year old with a hyperextension injury playing badminton. We have a coronal image of the shoulder. It looks like an arthrogram, and again we can see disruption of the inferior glenohumeral ligament with a J sign concerning for a Hegel lesion. And then we have the axial images. Uh, there is the mild edema along the posterior superior humeral head. Could reflect recent inferior contusion. Um, signal that may be some Hemorrhage, not sure, or so very rarely. Uh, it, it's almost never. Usually, if you get hemorrhage into a joint space, you won't have clot formation because the clotting factors are immediately diluted by the rest of the fluid in the joint space. But it can't, very rarely you can actually get clot formation if all you have really is blood and, and you don't have a lot of other fluid. And these were intraarticular clot. Probably have quite a bit of a tear uh, somewhere into the muscle or whatever. Yeah, probably, right? Michael, what do you think of this one? A 51 year old male shoulder dislocation during bicycling. So uh, it looks like I see probably an impaction fracture on the lateral humeral head. I also see disruption of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, it looks like, like a Hagel lesion. Yep. So probably hill sex with Hagel. And then here's another cut looking at the supraspinatus. The supraspinatus looks like it's torn as well at the footprint. Yeah. Here's some other images. Um, Um, is there something new I should be seeing? Well, like, I guess. The band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. I got it. Yeah, that's a probably continuation of the haggle that we were seeing. Yeah. And then here's some arthroscopic 
bindings here showing that there's a humeral head. Uh, here's the, the, the tear. John, do you want to comment about these uh, uh, arthrographic, uh, arth arthroscopy images? Um, not really, John. I, I see the head on the left, on, on the right um, image. And then um, you see the um, torn um, yeah, here's the um, ligament, um, yeah. uh, that being glenohumeral humeral ligament inferior. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Uh, that, that's, that's just the edge of it, I think. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, so it was, it's, it's, it's also known as the anterior capsular ligament. So okay. uh, you, you won't be wrong if you say that. And then uh, on the left side, there's a glenoid, uh, um, but it's not well not well visualized. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of debris in there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Well, we see some disruption of that posterior. I think that's a inferior glenohumeral ligament there and I think it's detached from the humerus so it's like a reverse haggle. Yeah. Yeah, so it's basically a haggle posteriorly rather than anteriorly and it's often called a reverse haggle. Right. Good. Okay. Jennifer. All right. So here we have two shoulder arthrograms of the right and the left shoulder and on the normal side we can see the normal attachment of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And then on the injured side, we can see a vulsion of the inferior glenohumeral ligament with contrast signal intensity extending along it. And this is the inferior glenohumeral ligament avulsion, but this is from the glenoid side. So it's often called a gaggle lesion rather than a haggle lesion, uh, which we can see there. Here's just another example of the, the same thing here where that inferior capsule has been pulled off along with the inferior labrum. And we can see the storage paralabral cyst associated with it. Okay. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Ma Michael? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I see some edema in the lateral humeral head. So there might be an impaction injury. There's also some irregularity at the glenoid attachment of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And also, it looks like there's probably a labral tear as well, so like a gaggle and a inferior labral tear, maybe. Yeah, here's an axial image. And we can definitely now see that there's tear in the inferior labrum, both anteriorly and posteriorly. Right. So that's really a... Yeah. <laughs> what we see on the MRI, we cannot really be sure whether it's unstable or not. Um, this, I'm not sure this is uh, first uh, dislocation, it may be, um, because uh, they waited for the MRI, but uh, uh, so you don't know whether uh, you need to operate on this patient or not. Um, are there, are there clinical, uh, like are there uh, maneuvers you do? Yeah, you, you have to have um, uh, clinical symptoms so, and on the examination. Uh, make sure that it's the shoulder, not uh, something above it uh, that's uh, involved um, before you think about surgery. So none of these, uh, you, you can really say for sure that you need an operation on. Um, the, 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 the gaggle and the Hegel um, um, injuries, um, they're, they can be pretty unstable with, with raising your arm. And, and then they wind up with surgery not an often. Um, and it's a difficult one, uh, usually done open. Thanks, John. Okay, uh, Ashu. Sorry, so a 39-year-old man with underhand ball player with right shoulder pain was on overhead uh, motion following trauma during a match one year ago. Um, on this radiograph, um, we can see some irregularity of the inferior glenoid, I think. Um, right there, yeah. I want to get an MR. Okay. Um, so what does, that, what, is the, what does that tell you when you see a, a bone like that? Um, probably that there's been some injury to the uh, 
the anterior glenohumeral ligament or capsule there, or or it could be a prior it could be a prior dislocation too. But well, sure, and and, and then also uh, in the case of a bone um, uh, injury and or an old old uh, injury. Patients 39. Um, um, the problem that that's uh, the, the, the worst part is if you're 20 and and you get uh, get the injury um, between 14 and 20 years of age. Uh, if you get it at 30, 35, well, you may be okay and and have a. Um, in other words. Um, considerable trauma to get the injury and then you, you, you get healing and um, unless uh, another trauma occurs you're fine uh, so the older you are the better off you are I think I, I mentioned this before sorry if I'm repeating myself good no, that's fine John uh, do you see anything else here Ashu um well, it looks like that they've labeled a lot of the things here. It looks like there's um, the torn inferior glenohumeral ligament there, um, and then it, you see this bonius, this osseous injury to the inferior glenoid, and it seems pretty edematous there, well, mildly edematous. Yeah. Right there, yeah. Uh, there, there's one other thing that, that um, you may consider in these injuries, um, especially after you get an MR and you can see that torn um, um, inferior um, um ligament. Um, put a patient in a sling for a couple of days and get AP x-rays uh, with a patient standing. And then you, you can see the humeral sag. If it sags way below the equator, uh, you got a problem uh, that needs to be fixed. Uh, that's one one way to look at this situation on examination as well. Uh, you probably will do that before you get an MRI. Right, right. What, um, but but don't put weight on it because you can cause more problems. Okay. And then here we can see the teres minor atrophy, and then you have to be concerned about possible axillary nerve injury. So you know. That's right. It's uh, nice to have these MRIs. We didn't have them in uh, my early years. Okay. All right. Why don't we go on and talk about the superior area? This is an area where some people call uh, micro instability or uh, where we get slap tears, which everybody's familiar with. Uh, the term microinstability was kind of coined by a Orange County orthopedic surgeon by the name of Nottage. Uh, and he claims that about 6% of the significant instabilities of the shoulder are in this category of uh, superior lesions. This was a number of years ago, really before slap tears became the rage, which was, they became the rage about 12 to 15 years ago. Uh, symptoms, they're similar to cuff tear disease. Uh, uh, you, you get some uh, instability findings, ET fatigability, periscapular pain, and symptoms of, of impingement. So the causes are superior labral tears or biceps anchor tears, uh, anterior superior labral detachments uh, called slack lesions, superior glenoid ligament laxity or tear, middle glenohumeral ligament detachment. We've already seen tears of the middle glenohumeral ligament and articular partial thickness cuff lesions. So let's start with slap tears. As John said the other day, this is a term coined by, by Steve Snyder from SCOE, uh, where you guys were one of the three of your work uh, associated uh, each week. And there are a bunch of different types. Uh, and so we're going to go through all of these. Uh, the bottom line, like everything I've said before, uh, it's best not to tell in your report as a surgeon that you have a type 7 slap tear because I'll guarantee you 95% uh, 90, will have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of the entire slap tears were in the radiology literature from, from different papers. John? 
Um, yeah, Snyder um, came up with four uh, different um, types. Uh, he he then go to ten, and uh, Campbell's goes to six. So, uh, so let's go to this. So let's kind of look at the nomenclature as far as where the tears are concerned. Some people call the location superior, anterior, superior, posterior, superior, posterior, inferior, anterior, inferior, and inferior. Other people like to use the, the o'clock position. Uh, the issue with the o'clock position is that many people, when you scan them, uh, they're really the, the top, where the, the top is kind of defined where the uh, biceps anchor is located, which is a supra uh, glenoid tubercle, and a lot of people there you've got rotation of the of the scapula, and often that uh, what looks like the top of the of the inverted of the pair is a little bit more anteriorly located. Uh, but uh, I think most of the people I know use the left nomenclature rather than trying to be more specific with a clock face. Uh, but I think it's reasonable to to do either one. So here are some diagrams that came from a paper out of UCSD and AJR a number of years ago. So a type 1 slap tear, as defined by uh, Steve Snyder, is degeneration or fraying of the superior labrum, but the biceps anchor is intact. So this is the area where you have fibrillation. Uh, when I dictate things, I call this a degenerative disease of the superior labrum. Uh, uh, well, what it stands for, if, if I may sure. add to that, is, is a superior labral anterior posterior. Right. And um, well, most orthopods um, uh, our age uh, or, or younger, they, they, they know it, but the, the real young uh, orthopods may not. I don't know. No, they, so. Uh, and, and it's, this is a very well-known lesion in the sports community. And uh, actually, uh, so you have to talk a little bit with the orthopedic surgeons you work with. Uh, one of the sports medicine non-surgical uh, people at, from down in Orange County associated with Curl and Job uh, last year uh, called me up and said, would I, instead of just saying degenerative change, would I, would I talk about slap tear? And I said, sure, but, but why? And he said, uh, not that it made any difference to him, but patients and their, uh, especially he does a lot of kids in high school and, and junior high, and he says their parents will come in and they all know what's, they all know slap tear. So they all ask him the question, does, does my child have a slap tear or not? So it listed as that in the report, it's a lot easier for him to just point it out and state it. So uh, uh, for, for these, the one through four type slap tears, it's it's not it's probably a fairly good idea to use the term slap somewhere in the report. And I keep trying to remind myself of that, especially when I dictate his patients. Uh, John? No comment. No comment. Okay. So if we look at this particular area, this is what kind of normal looks like. This is the biceps anchor, and we're just getting out of the biceps tendon. We'd have to next cut. We'd see it coming over the the humeral head. If you have severe external rotation, which a few patients will have, you can get you can actually see the biceps tendon and the coronal plane going all the way to the biceps anchor. But most of the time, patients are too uncomfortable externally rotating to that degree. So we'll, we'll see the anchor here, and then you can follow the biceps tendon out on successive images. Uh, and then this is the superior labrum, and this is a normal recess uh, by the... Uh, uh, which we talked about before. So that's kind of normal anatomy. Uh, this is a patient with a non-displaced slap tear. Here we can see some degenerative change within the superior labrum. And instead of uh, here, we don't really see much of a superior recess. If you have a prominent superior recess that goes all the way through, it should be a nice gentle curve hugging the articular cartilage here. This is really too straight to be normal. But we can see the biceps anchor is completely intact. <clears throat> So this would be a type 1, this was a type 1 slap tear. And then, as I've said a number of other times in previous lectures, uh, there was all the rage 10 years ago to operate on these and fix them. And uh, several papers came out saying patients did worse doing that. 
because it over constrains the shoulder. So uh, uh, people are much more ginger about whether they repair these now than in the past. I've never done one myself. Uh, I've read them on them a little bit, but not not that. I don't know. Pretty much everybody over 15 or 60 has some degenerative disease in this area. So, right, right. Um, uh, unless they're really symptomatic, you don't. Yeah. So, you don't play with it. So, in middle age or older people, I, I still just call this degenerative change. If they're young athletes, then it's probably okay, better, probably okay to to start using the slap terminology. But, but, but that's up to you and the people you work with. So that's a type one slap tear. Type two slap tear or uh, Snyder's second group involved the superior labrum, but it was a complete detachment of the superior labrum and it involves the biceps anchor. So here, here's a case where we can see here's the superior labrum, there's the biceps anchor, that's the normal articular cartilage, so kind of normal anatomy there, and that's a normal recess, there's the biceps, there's the labrum. Uh, here, what we can see is, here is the recess or the articular cartilage, there's labrum, there's something bright, there's labrum again, and then here's the biceps anchor, but we see a little signal within the biceps anchor. So that's a recess, that's a slap tear uh, going through into the substance of the superior labrum, and then we have a paralabral cyst, which makes us much more confident that it's an actual tear. And we also here see some abnormal signal within the biceps anchor. Uh, now, uh, Morgan further uh, divided slap two tears into A, Bs, and Cs. And I don't see this terminology much anymore. Uh, um, uh, type 2A, the tear is anterior to the biceps anchor. Type 2B, the tear is posterior to the biceps anchor. And type C, it, it's both anterior and posterior to the biceps anchor. Uh, the vast majority of these that I've seen have really been the type 2C, but I don't use this terminology anymore. And this comes from, from their paper where they're talking about an A, here's the B posteriorly, and the C goes all the way through. And here's a type 2C. Posteriorly, we can see uh, this is very irregular. And it's kind of thickened, uh, not that smooth appearance that we typically that we see for for uh, uh, normal recesses. Here it's also thickened, and we can see a little paralabral cyst. And there above we can see uh, the biceps anchor, which is thinned out here uh, with a cyst extending into the biceps anchor. And then anteriorly we can see we're getting just anterior to the biceps anchor here, and we can still see the slap tear uh, anteriorly there. Now, in our literature, we have lumpers and, and splitters, and, and, and uh, this fellow is a splitter. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I'm a lumper. I, I don't like to uh, do microscopic surgery. If I, I was going to do that, I'd be a dermatologist, I suppose. Okay. <laughs> now, furthermore, Morgan and their group uh, who do a lot of uh, baseball players, uh, said that a mechanism that they think of this kind of an injury uh, in, in throwers is that normally the biceps tendon comes nice and straight here superiorly, but when you get in that cocked position uh, in the throwing mechanism, you actually twist the biceps tendon, and that twisting mechanism, uh, they think, leads re repetitively over and over again, uh, thousands of times throwing the baseball, leads to uh, tears of kind of a, uh, avulsive tears of that biceps anchor and also the uh, the adjacent superior labrum. So they call this the peelback mechanism of, of injury. So you may you may hear that among some uh, of the one thing that the biceps does not do, and I don't think we've talked about this, is a slide in a groove um, down and up and down, um, it, it would have, it would disappear pretty quickly from the childhood on, uh, if if that was the case. So, um, if, if any of you think that the biceps tendon slides in a groove, um, you can forget that uh, it doesn't do that. Yep. 
the human. It's, uh, it stays in place, but it does twist, yeah. like uh, John just said. And so that they believe this peelback mechanism occurs in the late cocking phase of the throwing mechanism and the early acceleration. <coughs> So I don't remember who's next, but Michael, why don't you take this one? Major League Baseball pitcher. Okay, so Major League Baseball pitcher. Um, so there's marked irregularity of the superior labrum. And I don't necessarily, I don't definitely see, I don't know if it's just a slice, but I don't see a connection with the long head of the biceps. Yeah, that's so. Probably I'm worried that that's torn, that the slap tear that extends into the superior long head of the biceps. Yeah, and then on this one. And then there's a big paralabral cyst. Right. And you can see it a little better if we went through different cuts. And this just shows that it kind of extends anteriorly and here posteriorly. And posteriorly, yeah. With the paralabral cyst extending way back here. Uh, so this is a, a large uh, lap, a type 2 slap tear with this paralabral cyst. And this patient also has posterior impingement. Okay, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this one? Um, so here we have a 49-year-old female with shoulder pain. We have two um, coronal sequences here. We see a tear of the um, biceps anchor and the superior labrum. Um, looks like a slap tear. Um, and I, it looks like there's some pieces too. I don't know if that's yeah, I think pieces of the labrum. They were all attached. Uh, There's degeneration. Yeah. And uh, actually, the the biceps anchor was pulled off a little bit here if we went through all the different cuts. So here you can see there's the tear. Here's the biceps coming across. Here's the biceps anchor. And you can see the tear there with just a little bit of the posterior part of the biceps still attached here. And uh, this is really what it's supposed to look like if you have the peelback mechanism. Notice it's peeling from front to back, with the back still a little bit in place here. So this goes along with that mechanism of injury of the peelback mechanism. So this was a big type two slap tear. Okay. Uh, see, Ash, you did that one, right? Yep. Okay. okay, so here again, we can see contrast signal intensity along the anterior superior labrum and it looks like that's the superior glenohumeral ligament anteriorly it's also um, involved pulled off from the tear um, that looks like some periosteum I'm not sure. This is actually a paralabral cyst. Oh, a paralabral cyst. Okay. I think you're right. Yeah. And, and this is that cyst in the sagittal plane where we can see the little wall around the around the cyst. So this was a uh, another slap tear with a paralabral cyst. Oops. There we go. And here's just other views. And this cyst is going up into the sub suprascapular notch. So you'd want to look carefully for supraspinatus denervation changes, uh, which this patient didn't have. Okay? So that uh, cysts, cysts are pretty common in, in this condition, aren't they, John? Right, they are. Yep. Especially after 40. Yep. Okay, uh, Michael, what did you think of this one? Okay, so it looks like there is, now this I don't is, really see. This is an orthogram. This is a T1 fat set. This is PD fat set. Okay, so um, you said T1 fat set? T1 fat set, PD fat set. Okay. So um, I don't really see a superior labrum. There is a kind of hypointensity triangular structure posterior to the glenoid, which I'm not sure if that's just what structure that is at concerning for some displacement of something and it's I mean as far as superior liberal tear and torn biceps tendon there's a t2 so this thing back here is just fat and uh, uh, so it's just fat saturated okay but still on the 
I still don't see. I mean, it's still going to be a superior labral tear, a slap tear that goes into the biceps tendon. What's this thing? I'm wondering if that's actually like tearing through the biceps tendon, if that's just a thin piece of like tendon sheath hanging on kind of. Uh, well, notice that it's iso intense with muscle on the T1 fat set. It's hyper intense on the PD fat set and on the T2. So what do you think that is? But it's different from the joint fluid. Like, well, it's different from the joint. Uh, so I guess could this be like blood products? Because it's not fat. Uh, well, this is actually a paralabral cyst. And if you remember uh -huh. before, the paralabral cysts tend to be filled with a gelatinous kind of product. Like a protonaceous type fluid. That doesn't fill very well with arthrogram. So mm -hmm. here we can see this is arthrographic contrast. This isn't arthrographic contrast. So you could say that it doesn't communicate, but most of these will communicate. If you brought it back 12 hours later, you'd probably see some contrast in this. But, Got it. Uh, but uh, it's very, very slow to, for the contrast to diffuse into these gelatin structures because it's not free fluid. But this is what paralabral cysts can look like. It's just a funny location and uh, a funny shape along the surface. Here's what it is in the sagittal plane. That's the neck, which extends in the joint. And then we go out into the cyst farther out. And this is a tap two slap with this is just a paralabral cyst, which makes should make you more comfortable that you have a superior labral tear. It's just a funny configuration and location. But yeah, I don't think I've ever seen one laterally. I've almost all of them I've seen to go medial to the glenoid. But if you look at the, the signal characteristics and the different sequences, you can figure out what it is. And that's Got it. the reason why we like both T1 fat set and PD fat set in these in order to figure out some of these fluid collections, uh, which you can get in complicated cases. Okay. Is, is that uh, fluid above the capsule? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it looks like it. Uh, th 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 there's a some capsule that you can see there. Yeah, it's it's outside the joint space. It's out, yes, it's outside the joint capsule. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, that's... But Ashley, what do you think of this one? Um, okay, so here we see a um, a superior labral tear on the first image. Um, uh, it looks like a slap tear because you see it extending posteriorly on the second image, and maybe anteriorly as well, I guess. So these are all type two slab tears, and here's the contrast. In this case, we get a little, maybe a little bit of contrast. Paralabral cyst. Yeah. Paralabral cyst there. And then, wait, let's see. This is 92607. That's what it looked like. And then we go to 71708. So the patient came back, and what's what's occur, what's the story here? This is a follow-up. Um, is there like anchors? Has this been yeah. some surgical anchors there? Right, yeah, and right there, yeah. So maybe this is just repaired slap. Right. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, those are that's more obvious on the sagittal sequence. So that's what a slap repair looks like. Good. Okay. Uh. Okay, so here we have a CT arthrogram. Um, yeah, I see contrast signal along the superior labrum, and it looks like it's extending posterior to the biceps anchor, so this may be a, a slap tear. Here again, we can see that contrast along the kind of where you would expect the chondrolabral junction going posterior to the biceps anchor, so this is also a slap tear. Okay, so that's type two. Type three is a bucket handle tear that just involves the labrum where the anchor is intact. So it'd be a bucket handle tear up in that this area. Here's an example, it's hard to see here because this is an old study, uh, but this is the, the biceps tendon that was intact. And here the superior labrum is torn and we can see it's separated both from the biceps tendon as well as the uh, superior glenoid. So this is a bucket handle tear. Here's another bucket handle tear we can see coming up through here. And there's the superior labrum. The biceps anchor is intact. So this is another type slit, type three uh, 
uh, label tear. And just uh, the, the, these were kind of described as, as uh, Dr. Snyder saw them. As far as clinical relevance, uh, the type 2 is much more significant from a clinical standpoint. It's much more associated with clinical symptoms than the type 1 or 3. Uh, and these these were repairing a lot of these caused over constraint of the of the shoulder. So I think now these are either left alone or they're they're, they're removed. So a few of them repaired. And that biceps looks like it's degenerated. Yeah, I, I don't know. This is an arthrogram, John. There's a little bit of signal there. I agree with you there. The anchor. Yeah. Oh, but the fluid wouldn't go into the uh, tendon uh, if uh, it was normal, would it? No, probably not, but we may just be catching it, partial voluming it. We may be just catching the anterior edge and then some of the contrast in the same voxel here. We'd have to look. Uh, okay, got, got, gotcha. And then here we can see that uh, slap tear there. Here are other images where we can see the slap tear going anteriorly here into the anterior labrum. Uh, it, looks, it looks much more normal here. Right. Uh, if you look at it on the uh, uh, axillary view. Yeah. Okay, so that's the type three. Uh, type four slap tear is the one that's most uh, clinically uh, associated with symptoms according to the Snyder classification. And this is where you have a tear of the superior labrum, but then the tear extends longitudinally in to the biceps tendon. And as you kind of get a sense of here, in this particular area, uh, the biceps tendon is probably a more significant pain generator than the superior labrum. So involvement of the biceps is probably a key finding when you see pathology in this location. <clears throat> and then here, if we see, here's a case where it looks like there's a, a superior uh, labral tear here that looks like an abnormal superior labrum. Here we can see the biceps coming across. This is on 222.05. Now, when the patient came back on 5608, we can see now there's much more detachment of that superior labrum. And now we can actually see a tear extending longitudinally into the biceps tendon here. So in this case, this was probably uh, a type one slap tear, or, uh, and then with the biceps anchor intact, by the time when he came back, it was probably a, it was a type four, and uh, much more symptomatic. And here, and we can just see the two there as well, type four slap. Uh, now let me just do this one here. We can see. Uh, on the T1-weighted images, we have just a lot of increased signal intensity around that superior labrum and biceps. It looks darker on the T2-weighted images, but that's the biceps tendon. If you had all the images and could follow it, you could convince yourself of that. Just looking at these two images, I think it would be hard to be confident that that's actually the biceps. Uh, uh, this was a lot of increased signal intensity within both the superior labrum and the biceps, and at arthroscopy, this was all a degenerative tearing involving the superior labrum and the biceps, making it a type 4 slap tear. And then here's another example. A lot of degenerative change up here on the superior labrum, but I don't see a good biceps anchor. If we follow it down, we'll find that there's a lot of increased signal intensity within the biceps tendon. So I would call this severe biceps tendinosis and severe degenerative disease of the superior labrum. At arthroscopy, they call this a type 4 slap tear because uh, it involved both the superior labrum and extended longitudinally along the biceps tendon. And who did the last one? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember who did the last one. Jennifer, why don't you take this one? Uh, okay. Do you have it? Go ahead. Was that Michael? Yeah, I, I can go. Okay, go for it. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of signal on the uh, supraspinatus. Um, so it looks like there's a full thickness here of supraspinatus and retraction and maybe even delamination in the retracted fibers. We're not interested in the supraspinatus, but I agree with you. Mm -hmm. um, then in the superior labrum, it looks like there's maybe a defect. Look pretty small, but there's increased signal. 
And so is this one, is this a, just a cutover? Yeah, so this is a cutover. And this is typically why you'll see the patients in more internal rotation here because patients who, the more pathology they have, the more you're going to see them skin in internal rotation mm -hmm. because it's a more comfortable position. But this should be a nice black superior labrum and, yeah. and, and anchor. It's not. When you follow the biceps tendon out, this is the biceps tendon. It's going to yeah, it's pretty it's pretty thickened and increasing yeah. signal. And this, this is where it's going to come out because this is the inner tuberous groove. Mm -hmm. It's going to be right through there. So that's the next cut over. That's the next cut. Oh, this is a sagittal image. And now the sagittal, we can see it's markedly thickened with increased signal. Yeah, and this was also a type four slap tear. Okay, now type five is uh, is a superior. Uh, uh, tear, uh, typically a type uh, type one tear, but it extends anteriorly to involve the anterior labrum, uh, as as we can see here. So uh, here's a case where we can see a superior tear. Biceps anchor is mostly intact, mar markedly irregular tear of the superior labrum, and when, when we follow it anteriorly, it it, uh, it goes all the way down along the anterior labrum. And this is blunted, and this is actually part of the labrum pulled off here. So this would be a displaced uh, type 5 tear. And I used to give the types in my reports, but now I just describe the findings. So uh, here would be another uh, superior labral tear, which we can see up here. And then it goes down anteriorly to involve the anterior labrum uh, down and through here. So it's a, it's another, uh, and this patient had a hill sacs lesion and an anterior labral tear. A type six is an unstable is a tear uh, superiorly here, usually a very irregular superior labral tear, and then you got a tear of the biceps which is now unstable. So it's different from a type two or a type four. A type two is really a, a partial tear of the biceps where it's still Stay basically stable. A type four is a longitudinal tear in the biceps. The type six is where you have an unstable tear of the of the superior labrum. So here we can see uh, uh, that this really involves a superior labrum. I, I think probably most people would still call this kind of a type two, but but this was a very unstable biceps at surgery. So uh, this would really be should be put in the category of a type six. Again, the, the important thing here is to really describe it. You've got a superior tear, and you've got a, a near complete tear of the biceps anchor, is the way I would describe it in a report. A type 7 slap tear is a superior tear. It often involves the biceps anchor, but the key thing here is that you have a longitudinal tear that goes along into the middle glenohumeral ligament. Uh, so, anyway. Uh, I used to know who described all of these, but I've forgotten who described it now. This was described by a radiologist. Uh, and then uh, here we can see if we follow the tear from above, we had a slap tear above, but if we follow it out here, it goes out into the middle glenohumeral ligament here, uh, extending in that. So that, that was a uh, uh, superior tear extending in the middle glenohumeral ligament. Here we can see a superior labral tear. And if we do the axial images, we can see that there's some pathology here, either the superior glenohumeral ligament or the origin of the middle glenohumeral ligament. But if we follow it down, that's a torn longitudinal tearing of the middle glenohumeral ligament. So this, again, was another type 7 slap tear. And then a type 8, it's a type 2 up here, but it goes posteriorly. So here we can see a superior labral tear in this location. Uh, we don't see a good biceps anchor here. We'd have to go through the others, but it was markedly thinned and irregular. That's, and then if we go posteriorly, we can follow the tear going back into the posterior labrum, uh, back in through here, and then follow it extending down along the posterior uh, labrum here, all the way down toward the bottom. And, and you, t you see those a lot in weightlifters with bench pressures and so forth. So a lot of athletes will have those kind of tears, especially if they're football players, linemen, or uh, uh, baseball pitchers where they need to strengthen the 
uh, the pectoralis muscles. And here we can see a superior labral tear extending posteriorly here as well. So it would be a type 8. But again, I, I just describe the tear and, and not say what type it is. And another one going uh, posteriorly. Here. Rugby, rugby, rugby players. Yeah, that certainly could be. And it turns out once you get these more complex tears, what you'll often find is that they may have a little bit of everything. So they don't fit uh, uh, very well into type 6 or type 8. Uh, they, they tend to have a, a plethora of pathologies in the shoulder. Uh, and I think it's kind of uh, misleading to put it into any one of these categories. You just best to describe uh, the extent of the injuries, in my opinion. And the, uh, the long hair of the biceps starts to uh, fray um, and, and slide uh, up and down in that uh, groove, does it, John? Uh, it certainly can. And then, then when it finally ruptures, it just slides out of the groove. That's right. Yeah, because uh, a normal individual, uh, the, the biceps does not slide at all. Yeah. Uh, with these folks, uh, and then it be, be, begins to fray and then eventually tear. Yeah. Uh, either that or they're, they're, they're tear away from the attachment from the anchor. Yeah. And then we got type 9, which is basically a circumferential tear. I think this was described by Rick Rio, an orthopedic surgeon in Santa Barbara. Uh, going all the way around, and here we can see, if you would just look at it, anterior tear, posterior tear, there's a superior tear, and an inferior tear. So it's really a circumferential tear, uh, which he called a type 8 slap tear. And then with, par with paralabral cysts. I mean type 9 slap tear, excuse me. Uh, and then... Uh, Blocking on his name. He's actually a radiologist that works for us in New York. Described a type 10 slap tear, uh, which extends out into the superior glenohumeral ligament. Now, now oh, this is a caution. So, the radiology at type 10 slap tear is a superior label tear, which extends into the superior glenohumeral ligament. But in the orthopedic literature, there's also called a slap 10 tear which is described as a slight tooth lesion that extends posteriorly uh, and is associated with a chem lesion, which we already talked about. So again, another good reason to, to just describe the, the findings. And then here we can see a uh, superior labral tear going anteriorly, a little bit posteriorly. Well, actually, I'm sorry, superior labral tear going anteriorly and I guess it's involving the superior uh, bone humeral ligament. They did it arthroscopy. I'm not sure how confident I would be to say that it's involving the superior glenohumeral ligament just on these images. But, well, it, it does look like it's a, a capsular attachment. I just have a quick question. There um, have been sometimes in younger patients along the posterior labrum, we see something similar to that, those smaller images, the bottom left, where we just see a small cleft along the posterior labrum. Yes, such as like this image, but it doesn't go all the way through the chondral labral junction. And I've heard that there is some controversy about whether this is an early labral tear, say if this were a 15 or 16 year old, or whether this could be a normal variant. And so I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. I think it's clearly been established that they can be normal variants or not significant in the hip. I think in the shoulder, most of these are, are, are early uh, injuries to the, to the cartilage and the labrum, but they're not surgically treatable lesions. So there, there, there's really no specific treatment for it. But, but I, I don't think they're normal in the shoulder. Okay, and then here we can see a super labral tear. It looks like a type 3, but if we go to the interval, it extends out into the interval here, which technically would make this a type 10, uh, according to some. And then we can see the big paralabral cyst going into the suprascapular notch. And this, this would be a, 
a type 10 slap tear. And here again, we can see a superior tear extending out to a, a paralabral cyst going through there, a little bit of hemorrhage ligament. There's the tear. This also goes into that interval around the uh, superglenal hemorrhage ligament. Uh, and it's another tear. Again, I would just describe the findings. Uh, let me see. Ashley, what do you think of this case? Um, looks like the shoulder is fairly messed up. It almost seems like the glenoid's inferiorly displaced there. Um, there's a... There's, what do you mean a glenoid is displaced? The shoulder is dislocated superiorly, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, sorry, you can't hear me. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, subluxed on, and 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 hanging on top of the glenoid. Yeah, and it looks like there's an impaction injury there too on that uh, that's, coronal. That's, that's correct. Yeah, um, a lot of hemorrhage, a lot of edema. I uh, see. There's a lot of old stuff too. Yeah, and it looks like that. Well, I mean, the the labrum's completely deficient, uh, superiorly. It's gone. So is the glenoid. And one of the reasons it was the way you did is that the uh, corticoclavicular ligaments are completely torn here. This is not for the sports uh, department to work on. This is uh, right. a now a, a shoulder replacement uh, department. Right, right. So why don't we stop here and we'll finish the instability uh, tomorrow, okay? So, uh, and we'll, we'll finish off with multi-directional disability. Have a good evening, everybody. And Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Great. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you, John.